thank you, divorce. That's what I said five years ago when the judge issued me my divorce decree. <laughs> With that decree in hand, I was positive every problem I had was now part of my past along with my marriage. And as I walked out of the courtroom that day, I was sure I was walking towards a new life full of happiness. I was also sure that that perfect guy that was going to bring me that happiness was waiting for me right around the corner. Now let's fast forward a couple of months and the reality of being divorced with three little kids was slapping me in the face. There were so many incidents that I was so ill prepared for that were so hard. For instance, this one day the kids and I had gone swimming all day and on the way home they had all fallen asleep in the car. Yay. <laughs> but then, just as I was about to pull up in front of the house, I remembered we were all out of milk. In the past, I would have called home, asked the hubby to grab some milk, but there was nobody to call. So I thought, all right, kids, we're doing this. Turned the car around, drove to the local Circle K, went to one side of the car, got my son, Nathan, he was three at the time, out of the car, I'm holding him here. I go to the other side of the car, I gently shake my girls awake, Bella and Lacey, they were five and six at the time. They're half leaning against me, still half asleep. We walk into Circle K, thankfully somebody holds the door open. I can see the milk in the glass container. We're walking towards it. My son starts to wake up. He's crying, he's fussing. He doesn't want to be in the store. He wants to be home sleeping. My girls start to fuss. They're crying, it's loud. I don't know how I'm gonna even get this hand free to get the milk. Finally, I get it free. They're all crying loud. I want to cry. I'm tired and this is so hard. Finally, I get that milk. We're all loud, we get out of there, go in the car, I'm bawling. That was so hard just to get a gallon of milk. And that was the first time I got a glimpse into what the future held. This was going to be hard. It was also the first time I had this thought. Maybe, just maybe, I might have taken my marriage, my ex-husband, for granted. Just a little. <laughs> but I quickly let that flaw be super fleeting, and I found my reprieve on the weekends my kids were with their dad. I went to clubs, I went to bars with my single friends, and I dated obsessively. I dated with the mission of finding a new man, finding a man that was going to fix this hardship and bring me that happiness. Now, I reverted back to dating like I had before I was married, before I had kids. I was jumping all in, and it's like I was trying to force intimacy that the newness of the relationship just couldn't possibly withstand. It's like I had a split personality when I was dating. Half of me wanted total codependency. The other half wanted to run. I wanted to run the moment there was a real problem the moment real intimacy was called for. And by my third failed relationship post-divorce, I was seeing there was a problem. Every single problem that I had in my marriage, I was seeing repeated in these relationships. That third relationship ended with especially dramatic flair. We were sitting in his car and we were arguing. I was upset with him because he wasn't giving me enough. He wasn't making me happy. He wasn't spending enough time with me. And that argument quickly escalated to me yelling at him. You're not doing enough. You're not loving me enough. I need more from you. And as I'm yelling at him, I catch a flashback of myself yelling at my ex-husband in just the same way. You don't love me enough. You're not doing enough for me. And that's when it really hit home. All these problems from my marriage were still there. None of them had disappeared. And in that flashback, I knew that if I were to jump into that fourth relationship, every problem would follow me. So that's what stopped me in my tracks. Luckily, at this exact time, 
I was a couple of months into a life coaching certification program. Now, I wanted to be a life coach because I love fixing other people's problems. <laughs> right? It kept the spotlight off that hard work that we must do within, but I wasn't there yet. I couldn't look within. It was scary. It was hard. But you know what? The joke was totally on me because we couldn't coach another human being until we turned those tools inward and coached ourselves. We had to do a lot of peer coaching as well within the program. And so I was forced into some deep self-exploration. And as luck would have it, right after that third breakup, we had to do an assignment. We had to storyboard three significant events that made a big impact on us. Now, of course, I chose three failed relationships. So I get my poster board out. I divide it into three columns. And the assignment says to talk about those events with symbols, pictures, and phrases. So relationship one, I draw a broken heart. I write things like let down. Relationship two, I draw a sad face, and I write things like not enough love. Relationship three, I write things such as not enough time, non-committal. And as I am looking at these three events, the assignment says find the common theme. I think I have it. None of these guys made me happy. None of them gave me what I wanted. There's the common theme. But that doesn't feel right at all. This class is all about self-exploration. So then I wonder, what if I did a fourth column, a relationship with myself? What would I put in that column? Nothing. I spent no time with the thoughts in here. I never acknowledged the feelings here. I spent so much time running from myself, distracting myself. I didn't know myself. So how on earth could I expect these men to give me what I wanted, to make me happy, and to love me if I was unwilling to do it for myself? That's when the real work began. At first, I was really excited. I thought, all right, we've got a new project. I'm going to develop a relationship with myself. And I had all these amazing tools around me. I was in this life coaching course. I had these peers to coach with. I was part of an incredible yoga community. I had amazing teachers to guide me, to help me. I was journaling. I was meditating. I had so many tools for this mission of self-discovery. That excitement quickly led to something that was incredibly terrifying. I didn't know myself, so it got really lonely really quick. But I kept at it because I didn't want those problems to repeat. And as I started to listen to the thoughts, to just acknowledge the feelings, to observe my patterns, I wasn't liking what I was finding. I was discovering this girl, this girl that was so insecure that she was seeking constant validation from the men in her life to say she was lovable, to say she was worthy. I was finding this girl that was hiding in the disguise of self-perfection because she was so terrified of showing her flaws, herself, her whole self, to the world, to her friends, to her family, to herself. I was finding this girl that was trying to fix everybody else because it kept the spotlight off of what she had to work on. And as I discovered that, that fixing, that need to fix, 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 I remembered a time one year before I got divorced, where my younger sister called me and said, Sean, my boyfriend and I had a fight. I'm thinking of leaving him. So all big sister heard me was leaving. 
and I go into full action. I run around my house getting all my empty boxes and containers. I throw them in the back of my Tahoe, drive to her house, start packing her up fast and furiously, convince her to follow me back to my house. And what do you think she did? She, of course, went back to the boyfriend, processed it. They worked it out. And it hit me. All I needed to do was listen to her, to just be there for her. But what was so incredible about that story, I was one year from getting divorced. I needed to work on my relationship. I needed to work on my issues, but I was so quick to focus on somebody else. So with that discovery, every time I had that need to fix, I paused. I turned it inward and I processed. And I started to find I was getting to know myself more. My relationships with other people were deeper. And month after month, I started to find that just by acknowledging those perceived flaws, by bringing them to light, I was starting to accept them. They were okay. I was okay. And then the most unbelievable thing happened. New Year's Day, January 2017. The ex-husband and I, Scott, decided to spend a few hours together with our kids. We went to the local park, Indian Steel. We sat in the grass. We watched our three kids running around and playing. Every time they did something cute, we looked at each other and smiled. And at one point, I remember thinking, I would love to get back together with this man. But here's what was so incredible about that thought. It wasn't obsessive. I knew whether he said yes or no, that I would be okay. I could sit with myself in silence and enjoy my company. I was feeling pretty good in that moment. I was feeling good with myself. And I didn't quite know what happiness was, but feeling good with myself, that felt like happiness to me. But he did say yes. And it's going on two years this January. And while the relationship is not perfect, I've learned that's not the point. I have learned now that I've got the security the skills, the acceptance to meet those problems and to work on them with him. I have learned every time I have that need to fix, to instead turn that inward and just work on me. And as I just accept myself, it appears to me that there's so much more acceptance of Scott, of the relationship. And in that acceptance, this new level of love has just grown and bonded us so much more deeply. So now I say, thank you, divorce, for bringing my problems to the light so I could work through them, accept them. Thank you, divorce, for giving me a deeper relationship with my loved ones in my life. And thank you, divorce, for giving me a relationship with myself. Thank you.